Mm -hmm. Trust. Stupidity. Oh, no. Trust. Yeah. So... Good morning. My, my, um, my testimony, really, this morning is quite similar. I'm just going to share it before I do this. I wanted to put my boiler on this week. And the other night, I was freezing. My, even I have to wear bed socks. I mean, what's all that about? I thought, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. So I was too scared to put my heating on. Because I'm always conscious that it's been off for so long that the boiler might blow up or, or the radiators will leak. And I cannot bleed all my radiators because they're rubbish. And, and getting up to the top of the house, I've got three stories. And then coming back down to put the water in the tank. And all that business, I hate it and it frightens me to death. So there's a guy that's done most of my house. And it's, his name's Salv. And um, he's Margaret and Joe's son. He came, every time I ring that man, just for a little thing, he came, a bit like yours, Pat, and he started at the top of the house and he worked his way all the way down and then put the water back in my boiler, which he showed me again what to do. And when he left, I sat there thinking, because I feel very vulnerable when stuff like that happens, when I feel vulnerable not to be able to turn it on. And I sat there and I just thought, thank you, Father, that you know, even when you feel vulnerable, there's always somebody. God always has somebody in your in your back pocket, who will come and help. And, you know, he's, he's just really helpful to me, which I'm really grateful to him. So thank God for him. So what is radical trust? Well, the Bible, the, this, is, this is the Bible. This is what Wiki says. Radical trust is when one takes into account the capabilities and history of the person being trusted. Mark, Io recognizes a risk. Mark might drop him and makes the conscious choice to trust Mark anyway. How many of us are in or have been in situations where you're anxious because you know if you keep walking forward and trusting for this thing that you're going to feel vulnerable and you're going to feel anxious that God ain't going to turn up for you. But do you still walk anyway? Or do you pause your life and, and, and the anxiety of, of maybe God not coming through for you or somebody else not coming through for you. So this morning, I want to continue. Um, we're looking at specific people through the Old Testament. So this morning, we're going to look at Hezekiah. Hezekiah is one of the good kings out of all of them. And there were some rotten beggars. He is given the, I suppose, the accolade of being the best king. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do a synopsis, which means I'm just going to do a, an overview of him. Because you find him in all of those books. He was a busy man. But because you know the Bible isn't written chronologically, then He's all over the place. If you've got a chronological Bible, have a look at it and see where the Psalms are jotted into, into Kings and into Chronicles and into Samuel. We think the Bible is written as we've been given it, but it's not. So that's why Hezekiah is all over the shop. He's in loads of books. So don't be put off by that. Hezekiah's father was Ahaz. What a atrocious fella he was. He was evil. He was an horrible king. And under his um, power, people were put into poverty. People were killed for the simplest thing. If they didn't bow to the idols and everything that he'd saturated the area with. But the Bible describes Hezekiah as a king who had a close relationship with God. He did what was good and right and faithful before the Lord his God. But Ahaz refused the advice of the prophets. Isaiah was around in them days with Hezekiah. I'd love to have been Isaiah's mate, but not when he prophesied, because it was always doom. But 
he seems like a decent, decent guy. But Ahaz just brought evil and chaos to the kingdom that he'd been given responsibility over. He was an idolater. He placed an Assyrian sort of type of altar, which is very beautiful, I have to say, um, in the temple at Jerusalem. That's like, that's like um, the head of the council coming into our space and putting statues all around the place that he wants us to worship and bow down to. It would make me feel incredibly uncomfortable. And theologically, I smash them to pieces. But, but that's what it could be like with somebody treacherous over us. When I was growing up, I often looked at my parents, and I'm sure when I say this, this is going to echo um, in some of your minds. I used to look at my mother and father and go, if I'm ever going to have children, I ain't going to bring them up like that. There are elements of our parents that we do not want to um, put into our children's lives or our, our grandchildren or our friends' children, no matter whether you've got children or not. It's like, I'm not going to treat them like that. And I'm sure Hezekiah had that because he watched his father. He watched this, this evil man who even killed some of his own family. He watched them and said, not a chance. So Hezekiah began his reign at 25 more passionate, more helpful to his people. I've often wondered what he was like internally. You know, when David's writing the Psalms, you, you see that um, we can see the external David when he's worshipping God. And then some of the Psalms are so intimate and real. You can see the real David inside. You can see his soul bed, bed on a piece of paper. Bed? Yeah, bed <laughs> on a piece of paper, which we call the Psalms, which are beautiful. After Ahaz's wicked reign, after he died, for Hezekiah, a lot of work to do. Boldly, boldly he cleaned the house out. He went round everywhere, taking down um, statues. He took down the, the, the altar that they put in there. He even took down, do you remember Moses Moses' staff turned into like this snaky thing. And even the people um, that knew the context of that started to worship that as well. So he had to smash that down. He was a very brave man. He brought back the Levitical priesthood. He reinstated Passover, which became a national holiday. And for our Jewish um, uh, people, that's exactly the same. It's still a holiday for them. Under, they reckon, under Hezekiah's reforms, revival came to Judah. Now, when you're king, I suppose this type of action seems um, easy. You just go in and just wipe the house clean. Do you remember Jesus, when he did that at the temple, he went in and he went, I'm not having this. And I can see the echo from Hezekiah. I'm not doing this. And Jesus echoes that in the New Testament. I'm not having that. And he gets rid of stuff that takes people's eyes off God. The reign of fear had gone. And now Hezekiah was leading his people down a pathway of trust. Sometimes we have to do what is right. Not what is safe or popular. Sometimes we have to do what's right. Hezekiah did what was right. And not what's safe. Or popular. And I think if we're really all honest, we've been in that context at some point. Do you know, God still really wants to reveal his presence to us. It's not abstract. It's not just out there for everybody else, but it's there for you. Just for a moment, yesterday while we were in this conference, I felt that. I felt this is really all just quite abstract. It's just like, I'm just sitting here. And, Lord, it all looks a bit out there. I feel outside of it. And, but it doesn't stop me worshipping. It still doesn't stop me walking and taking hold of that hem of his garment. Even when you feel like that. I, don't feel, I didn't feel like that after. It was just one of those moments. It's just like, wow, this feels a bit abstract to me. 
but it isn't. It's beautiful. So he reveals his presence and power, and he invites us into that full, full, full life of devotion. But I've got to be honest, and, you know, for the amount of time I've been listening to people, which has been most of my life, if I'm honest, we can prefer the convenient and limited levels of trust and devotion to God, if we're honest. It's that thing, as long as our family, put our families, and if this is right, I'm not, I'm not uh, even suggesting that we shouldn't, but sometimes we put our everything first, outside of God, and then we give him the last bit, whatever that last bit is for you, because of fear. So we don't give, we don't turn up at church when we're going through nonsense that other people have sinned against us or we've sinned against others or the stuff going on that Helen um, was articulating around communion. And then we don't come to church. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to retreat from all of that. And when I'm better, I'm going to come out and play. But I've got to tell you that, you know, Hezekiah, every prayer he prayed, God leaned into him because he was faithful. He had a radical trust in God, irrespective of whether he got anything from him. But he leaned in. God calls us to be radical, trusting, trustful disciples. Him first. Him first. Him first at every point. Whether you've got to pay a bill, whether you've got to do this, that, and the other. I am asking you, as somebody who is interesting, um, one of the people in my family have never got their head around tithing, my tithing, still never got their head around it. And I said, I said again when I was away last week, have you ever seen no food in my cupboard? When I was a single parent, when I was out of my social security money, I started to tithe. This is not a money sermon. This is just something that's popped into my head. I gave because I trusted Jesus, not to get anything back, but because of what he'd already done for me. That's what I gave out of. And I have never, ever gone hungry. As you can see, <laughs> my daughter's like, ah, wah. <laughs> even she recognizes that still. It can be fearful being in a context as a Christian disciple being so trusting in God that it makes you feel fragile. But God has you. He holds us. It's that, will my bills be paid? Will my job be okay? Will people laugh at me when I say I trust Jesus more than anything or anyone? Will they laugh at me? Because Hezekiah put God first, there was... Um, in everything he did, God prospered him. He held firm to the Lord and did not stop following him. He kept the commands the Lord had given Moses. And the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook. How many of us want to be like that? Come on, be honest. Thank you. In 701 BC, Hezekiah and all of Judah faced a crisis. Not the crisis like we've got, but it's a crisis that feels the same. The Assyrians, the dominant world power at the time, invaded Judah and marched against Jerusalem. The Assyrians had already conquered the northern kingdom and some of the other surrounding areas. Who does that sound like at the moment? Hmm? There's never been anything any different. It's always been like that. In their threats against the city of Jerusalem, the Assyrians openly defied the God of Judah, likening God to a powerless little idol. That's very naughty. But that also sounds very familiar. So faced with the threat, Hezekiah sent word to his best mate, Isaiah. And the Lord sent Isaiah to him and said this, Jerusalem will not go under. There will be no siege, because that's what the Syrians were coming to do. They were coming to take over Jerusalem. And God said, no, not on my watch. And not on your watch, Hezekiah. And Hezekiah prays this. 
Hezekiah prays a beautiful prayer, asking God to vindicate him. Do you notice that as soon as something happens, Hezekiah digs in to prayer? He digs into prayer and he asks for wise people to come and give him counsel. O Lord Almighty, God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone. Cherubim just means helper. That's what they were. And that's what they are right now in the heavenlies, helping you alone are God all over the kingdom of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. He wasn't afraid to say to God, have you got your eyes open? Can you see what's going on? Listen to all the words Sennacherib has sent to insult the living God. God retaliates. And God, as usual, is faithful to Hezekiah. And that night, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 people. Wow. When the people got up the next morning, I find this hilarious. When the people, it's not funny, but it made me laugh. When the people got up the next morning, there was just dead bodies everywhere. Really? <laughs> 185,000 odd people and the rest of the Assyrian camp get out, look out and go, oh, there's lots of dead bodies. What were they doing while all these people were getting slaughtered? Hiding. That's what they were doing. And when they peeped out, when everything was sorted, they came out. And I think there's a, a link for us there somewhere that when everything's sorted and God has done his job, and you've paid your bills, and you've done everything, and you're blessed. I hear that such a lot. I just think, but I don't understand how you're blessed. I want to know the detail and what you did to get to that point. And if we've hidden and we've retreated, then. The rest of the Assyrians broke camp and withdrew. The Bible says, so the Lord saved Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem. He took care of them on every side. And that's what he still does for us. So later on in Hezekiah's reign, he became sick. And Isaiah told him to get things in order. Get your house in order, Hezekiah, because you are going to die. But Hezekiah went to the Lord again and prayed, begging God to be merciful and to remember all the good he had done. That sounds a bit arrogant, doesn't it? However, before Isaiah had even left the king's house, God told Isaiah, go and tell Hezekiah that his prayer has been heard. Hezekiah asked, please, Lord, extend my life another 15 years. He was very specific about what he wanted. And then Isaiah, the Bible says, applied a poultice. Have you ever seen a poultice work really well? My brother went skiing to Italy, and uh, he came home with a stick that went through his thigh here, out to the other side. But I remember my mum taking him to the hospital, and they got all the extra out, but they couldn't get the middle bit out. So my mum took a big loaf of bread, took all the bread out of the middle, put hot water on it, and soaked his thigh with this bread, and that piece of stick worked its way out. How clever is that? It's archaic, but it works. <laughs> Who would know? Anyway, that was just a little for your bag. Soon after his healing, Hezekiah made a huge mistake, and the Babylonians, who were evil, provoked him. They touched his pride and they sent him a gift, sneaky. They sent him a gift going, we hope you get better. In his foolish pride, Hezekiah showed the Babylonians all of his treasures, all the silver and gold, everything that he'd stored up over the years. Isaiah, his mate, rebuked him. You silly boy. That's my version of the Bible. Silly boy. And he prophesied this, that one day he would be taken to Babylon 
these people, his family, along with all his descendants. And that's where they would finish their lives. They would die. They would be killed. And the Babylonians would take over, which they did. The next king was a man called Manasseh. Whoa, if you want to read about somebody really mean, read about him. What a treacherous man. What a treacherous king. So, Hezekiah's life is quite good, isn't it, really? Radical trust in every area. and Just a little bit of a bump in the road at the end of his service to the Lord. His faith was more than superficial. And, and, and I see that in his bold reforms. Hezekiah's trust in the Lord was rewarded with answered prayer. So what does it mean? What does it mean for us? Well, firstly, Hezekiah can remind us not to be consumed by earthly stuff. Don't brag about what we've got because the Lord has given it. Don't brag about it. Be faithful to God and continue to say thank you for it. You think, the thing that Hezekiah did is he didn't acknowledge God when the Babylonians came. Because all the time before he used to pray, I'll go to God first and we'll get Isaiah in. And he didn't. He boasted. Stupid boy. Radical trust means radical trust. Trust when God does not come through the way you and me, the way we want him to. You're not pregnant, but you still trust God. You've not got a job, but you still trust God. You've been betrayed, but you still trust God. You're sick, but you still trust God. You're lonely, but you still trust God. You're afraid, but you still trust God. In the context that we're living in the moment, we are called to radical trust. And sometimes that might mean giving away some of what you've already got, what you've been blessed with. Wise decisions have people around you that are helpful. Don't compromise your convictions, but trust him. And when it doesn't seem fair or right, remember there's always a bigger picture. We know this, don't we, church? We know it all. We've heard it a million times. But today I pray that somebody takes that, takes the hem of that garment and has a, a, a transformation that goes on on the inside. The Lord is with you. Your faith has been strengthened and is not extinguished because you know God is walking with you. Let that be a truth for you. The Holy Spirit fireproofs your faith and the flames of hell. I love this quote. The Holy Spirit fireproofs your faith and the flames of hell are no match for the fire in heaven. The devil has been defeated. Defeated for all things. Don't give him anything. It's the devil. No! He's been defeated. Let it be. It's going to squeeze your faith over the next few months. Let it squeeze it because you'll be shaped in this context of discipleship in a really good way. Remember God's faithfulness to you in the past. Remember that. Sometimes we just get a bit, you know, numpty-fied. And we say to God, you haven't answered my prayer you remember what God has already done for you. Has he been faithful? Yes, he has. Remember that and draw from that confidence that God will always be faithful to you. But it may just not turn out how you want it to. I'm going to finish with this quick list. Someone said, and when you don't trust, you close off and you only think of yourself. You defend what you have, you hide. He who trusts gives themselves over to the other. He faces the world with an attitude of gracious benevolence. Radical trust changes things. He, Hezekiah pulled down the idols. What have you erected in your life that's taken first place? Helen helped us earlier. Worry, hopelessness, sickness, people, work, friends. They can become, become idols. Radical trust makes mistakes. Sin can creep in. Hezekiah learned the hard way. Radical trust listens to the wisdom of others. Isaiah was a good, a good person for Hezekiah. Who is in your life? Radical trust needs prayer. Are you moaning 
or are you laying out your prayer on the altar before God? Radical trust is about being honest with Jesus. Keep looking up, folks. Keep holding on. Keep believing. And if you haven't got radical trust today, make it your first option in the kingdom. It will shape you in a way that you've never been shaped before. So may God bless you as you take snippets of this, nuggets that the Holy Spirit will help you to work through. May God bless you as you see transformation around you. God bless you as you see your confidence rise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.